Hello and welcome to this edition of Upfront. I'm your host, Nancy Wilmot. And once again, we're talking about COVID-19 on today's show, or more exactly on the effects of living under the restrictions placed on us during this time of the COVID-19 pandemic. You can see I'm coming to you from my home. I'm still not able to go into our office, but I am working. And that's important at a time when so many of our friends and neighbors, family members are not working. That level of unemployment has had a negative effect on economies across Canada, cities large and small, and certainly on Port Alberni, which is why I'm very pleased to introduce today's guest, somebody who probably knows the nuances of the local economy and small business better than anybody, Mr. Bill Collette, Executive Director of the Alberni Valley Chamber of Commerce. Bill, welcome to Upfront. Well, thank you very much, and that was a very uh, lovely introduction. I'm honored. <laughs> Well, Bill, you and I have talked about this often, and I know that you have your finger on the pulse of, of what is happening with business in this community. I always come away learning something from our conversations. And so I want to go back to the very beginning of, of this being felt in Port Alberni, back to first the second week of March, when it first became obvious that business was not going to be able to continue as it had. It was going to be interrupted in one way or another. And what I want to know is, what was your take at that time, at that, that snapshot in time? What was the business community in Port Alberni facing? Well, I guess even, you know, for myself, I had to wrap my own head around this because it was so perplexing. It was so um, shocking uh, to, to think that we could and would and did shut down the economy. I mean, it was just... Who would have ever thought that as recently as January and February, shut it down, stop everything, put the brakes on. So just even myself uh, having to figure that out and how, you know, now I had to figure out how, how can I, what can I do? How do I help? Can we survive this? Because that was a big concern initially for myself was, okay, um, how does the chamber survive? I mean, we're supposed to be here to help out the business community. And I had to make sure that we could turn the lights on. So it was, it was the first few days were just um, shocking. Uh, I just can't really describe how difficult they were just to wrap my head around where we were at, where we had it. I think it's funny that you start that with that sense of disbelief because you know, I go back to my own experience and even the day before we were told to pack up our desks and, and move to working at home, none of us would have believed it was possible or at least not possible to happen that quickly. And yet it did. We, we shifted gears and we moved into another situation almost seamlessly. And I'm guessing that depending on the type of business, um, where they were in their business life, that it was more difficult, less difficult, but everybody had to make that transition. Yeah, it's, you know, um, you're familiar with our McLean Mill. We hired the young woman out there that started here, came here on Sunday, I think it was March 15th, and virtually everything shut down on the 16th. I mean, so March 15th, we thought we're good to go. And uh, we knew, obviously, it was in our backyard. We knew we had some problems, but um, it was that sudden. And, and so it, it's just been incredible, really. So I think to really answer your question at the start was that it was sheer panic. And, uh, uh, you know, just the the unknown, like, where's this going? How long is it going to last? Uh, what about me? You know, everybody's thinking the me world, right? What about me? How does this, how am I going to come through this? Yeah. So the first few days were all about that. And, and Bill, you and I both have friends who are business owners in this town. And oh my gosh, I had one woman who, who owns a retail store. And she told me that first week she didn't sleep. Her mind was just reeling with all of the, the possibilities, the what ifs, the why nots, all the moving parts that kept changing. And her mind just couldn't slow down trying to figure a way through it. Was that a common experience with other merchants? Oh, absolutely. Um, so we, one of the first things we did was we... Um, got involved with the city right away. Um, and fortunately, I have a really good relationship with many at the city. And, and so, uh, you know, we jumped on 
on that right away. Uh, the city agreed, uh, several partners, ourselves, City Community Futures, uh, we all recognized that we needed to talk to the business community. And um, at first, the thought was, let's do a, um, a typical, you know, survey online, tick this box, tick the next box. And I really resisted that. Um, and, and, I, and I'm really proud of that because um, I didn't want that kind of survey. I wanted us to phone people, talk to people, do something unusual, if, if you can believe that, which is actually pick up the phone and phone around. And I got buy-in from, from our partners, City and, and Community Futures. And, and so that was the first thing we did. And, um, and that was a challenge because, A, we didn't have phone numbers. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not using phone numbers anymore. And of course, some of the businesses were closed. So how do we track them down? Will they answer their phone? Um, so we ran into obstacles that 20 years ago, we had never run into those obstacles, right? But we ran into immediate obstacles and how to reach the, the business owner. But we were quite successful at the end of it. It took us probably three weeks with about, at a total, we probably had about eight different people involved in the calls, uh, mostly through us. Uh, one, one city uh, woman helped us as well, and, and one from Community Futures, but the rest was us. And um, we just went hard at it. And, and we, we ended up talking to more than 300 uh, business owners, which was pretty impressive, really. Um, and, and we really, some of the calls took five minutes, some of them took close to an hour. Yeah. And, and I was comfortable with that because if they wanted to talk, you know, we had to listen, right? And uh, that's what we did. And what kind of questions were you asking? What kind of information were you hoping to glean from this? Well, just in the early days, it was like, you know, where do you see this headed? Um, um, have you had to release staff? Uh, do, do you sell, see yourself reopening in the future? Um, you know, the, the, the basic kind of questions that were almost, you know, would we ask the same questions today? No, we wouldn't, right? This was back then. It's only three and a half months ago, but still, um, you know, we just formulated a, probably about eight questions. And um, it was just more like, what do you think? And are you going to survive this? And and uh, how many people have you laid off? We also found out, we wanted to find out how many employees they had in the first place, right? So how many employees do you have? And, and uh, what's your role in the organization and so on? So we learned a bit about the organization stuff we maybe didn't know, um, but we, you know, that's really where we started was just finding out, getting the pulse. And from that snapshot, from those answers that you received, granted at, at just that specific moment in time, how did you feel about the sustainability, the survivability of small business in this community? At that point, not good. Um, you know, as we were talking to people, it was it was frightening. And um, as you point out, I know lots of the business owners. Uh, some of them I consider friends. Others. I, uh, you know, maybe they're not friends, but I admire them and I respect them and I, and, and I, you know, just I'm thrilled that they do what they do. And it was heartbreaking. Uh, some of the phone calls were tears on the other end, grown men, um, you know, grown women, obviously, but you don't expect, you know, the, the, the man to cry, but he did and they did. And, um, uh, you know, and especially the businesses that have been around for decades, you know, they battled everything and come through no problem. And, and then they get told to shut down or they feel they have to shut down. That's a key point because many businesses weren't actually told to shut down, but they did. Um, I think pressure um, to do so and, you know, public pressure, online pressure, whatever. Um, you know, they, they, would, they would shut down and... So you think as many, you know, all these businesses as well, you know, been around 30, 40, 50 years, shut down. Yeah. Unbelievable. And I think about the small businesses that were just getting ready to open up, that had invested all of that time and money building up to an opening day, whether it was, I don't know, March 15th or, or April 1st or May 1st, and suddenly COVID hit and all that investment was for naught because there was no opening day. How did they survive? You know, I'm thinking of one just off the top of my head here that um, had opened, 
They opened late in 2019. Um, young couple moved to Port Alberni, worked incredibly hard to uh, reconfigure the building that they that they purchased, and uh, had done a great job. Great product. They were going to be flying, and um, this hit. You know, how do you not just your your heart is pulled out because you just have so much admiration for these people, yeah. and who would expect this, yeah. you know? Um, and, and we had other businesses like that, that were, you know, ready to go, you know, just about to turn on the light switch and somebody turned it down. And yet, after, after all of this, so many of the businesses were able to put together plans that helped them bridge over this time, survive, in some cases, thrive during it. And I'm just amazed at the, the different ways that different businesses managed to to operate well i guess that's why you define these people as entrepreneurs right what is an entrepreneur i haven't looked it up in a dictionary but it's somebody who um you know has this dream and this goal and this passion so you know a brick wall stands in front of them well they figure out okay i'm going to go through the wall or around the wall and that's what these people eventually did. The, the, the woman you're referring to, I'm not sure who it is, but not being able to sleep was pretty much everybody. And, you know, so they're trying to figure out, do I go through the wall or do I find a way around it? Or do I climb over it or dig a hole and get under it? One, one way or another, they were going to get to the other side of the wall. Yeah, and I mean, when I think about it, we've got... We've got service industry, we've got food industry, we've got retail stores, so many different kinds of businesses. Each would have had their own unique set of challenges. And yet, somehow or other, they made it work. Um, yeah, the, the freezer meal one, uh, we ordered from them. And, you know, it was dine out at home, basically. You get a bottle of wine, you know, which was great that that became permitted. Um, and a and, uh, great meal, you know, instructions how to cook it, you know, uh, impressive and delicious and, and price effective for the consumer. Um, so it was, it was very good. Another business, um, these folks, um, a restaurant, uh, the owners there had um, been away just before COVID hit. So when they got back, they had to go into immediate self-quarantine. Um, so their staff um, had to shut the place down, and and so they they shut right down. Uh, they closed the doors. They they were never in the takeout delivery mode, so they 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 shut it down. Well, it so happened one of our former presidents contacted me after reading one of our newsletters, and um, reached out to me and 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 said something about this particular restaurant, and he said, I you know. This fellow is, a, is, is big in the church. And he said, I could get 100 people to order from that particular restaurant, but I don't know them. I said, well, I do. I'll connect you. So I connected the two of them I, by email, you know, and, um, and um, connected the two of them. They immediately struck up a conversation. And within 10 days, the restaurant opened for takeout and delivery as a test they just blew the doors off of their sales. They couldn't keep up. So now they're reopened fully, um, but takeout and delivery, or maybe I don't think they went into delivery mode, but just takeout is probably part of their permanent model now. Yeah. And their sales, um, you know, they just, it, they, they were blown away by it. And, and I credit the one fellow that, you know, our former president that brought in, you know, he wanted to do something so he got the 100 clients, and that helped the business recognize, oh, wait, maybe there's an opportunity for me here. So many stories like that. But really what you're talking about, Bill, with this 100 orders is shopping local, is convincing the consumer that there is value in spending their money locally beyond just that purchase, right? But I don't need to tell you, you've been singing this song for as long as I've known you. I have, and I think where I'm fortunate is I'm a former business owner, and 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 I I understood and I understand the world of shopping local and what it means not to, and how challenging that is for the, the entire community, right? It, you know, I think a lot of the public don't 
recognize the real value to shopping local, whether it's employing their daughter or their son or their aunt or their uncle or their wife or, or spouse, right? Um, and what that means for the community and contributions that go to every society. You're, you've been involved in many and you know the donations that come from business. All of that's because of Shop Local. And every dollar that is spent locally is respent and respent and respent locally. It all it all comes around. I, I, I'm optimistic that um, that people will recognize through this that 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 needs to be part of their future habits. I'm not. I you know uh, I I am seeing you know vehicles in town delivering from outside sources that concern me, um, but at the same time. I'm still optimistic that maybe this will help everybody understand the value of it. But we we are, of course, moving through this. Things are changing as well. So we're, we're leaving phase two and we're moving into phase three. So restrictions on some many businesses are loosening up. And I can't help but wonder, is it's changing the working model again, but is it making it more difficult in some cases? And in particular, I think of restaurants um, that have, have found ways to operate without having guests seated inside, but now they're allowing guests inside, so they have to have staff, but they can't have a full restaurant. It's got to be difficult. How is, how is that working out? Well, you know, COVID has, is, is far more than a health problem. Far more. It's an economic problem uh, and it's an employment problem, but problem, it's, it's just many variables to it. I mean, obviously it starts with a health problem that we have to address. Um, but you look at these businesses, um, these restaurants in particular, I owned a restaurant. Um, we needed to be 80, 90% capacity to balance the books, to, to be in any sort of, potential profit margin. The margins are so slim and people don't understand. I mean, I get it. They don't understand. They see the price point that you pay for, you know, a steak or a burger or a pizza or whatever, and they think it's through the roof. They don't understand the cost of cheese and they don't understand the cost of beef and all of that. That's understandable. Um, but now when you reduce their capacity um, by 50%, and now it's maybe a little less than that in some cases, it just makes it almost, you know, I, I fear for them because how can they survive, right? And restaurants are built, fundamentally built on the model of human interaction, right? I see you at a restaurant, I'm going to go over to your table and shake your hand and shake your husband's hand and, you know, have my arm resting on, on your bench or whatever because we're social beings, we know each other. Well, that's no longer permitted, basically, right? We have to stand two meters apart and, 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 and talk louder. And it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, except it's, it's like they're darned if they do and they're darned if they don't because they have to open their doors. If they don't open their doors, they don't get people in the seats again, they're going to lose that clientele. So it's like they have no choice in some cases but to, to move into this next phase. And, and, and they are, right? They're figuring out ways to do it. As I said earlier, they're, they're going through the wall or they're digging a hole under the wall. Um, you know, the, I, I know you and I are talking the same restaurant and they've built a backyard patio now and other restaurants, the one on, on Johnson Road, a franchised restaurant, have built another outside patio. Um, the one I referred to earlier got into the takeout world. They're all figuring out a plan yeah. and um, to to try and get through this. None of them expect to make money, no. I, I don't think. They just want to be able to pay their bills. Probably, they probably all recognize that they're going to have to personally fund their business more and for an extended period of time, and they're prepared to do it because they're entrepreneurs. But in terms of paying those bills, I can't help but think it's got to be a little bit easier in a town the size of Port Alberni to pay for those four walls than if you were operating a business in downtown Vancouver, there has to be a silver lining to doing business in a small town. We're, that's why I, I, I think, um, you know, the bigger cities in some ways have it much tougher um, than we do. We have favorable lease costs. We, we, in many cases, the tenant knows the landlord and 
and the, the landlord comes in for dinner once in a while, you know, so there's that relationship there, that personal relationship that uh, may be beneficial to helping out. And, um, um, and of course, some of the government programs help out as well. Um, so, you know, it's everybody's stick is on the ice, right? They're all, everybody's doing their part to try and, and, and mitigate this. Who would have ever thought liquor laws could change so fast? They're, I mean, we have a beer subscription service in this community now. I can order a, a bottle of wine with a, a meal from one of our best restaurants for delivery at my door. Um, and I think of, of retail. My, my friend who owns a retail stock, shop, um, she began to put together personal shopping bags. So she would contact you and say, I, I've got a, a selection picked out for you. And she would have taken time to curate a selection of clothes that would fit you to your style. You could pick them up, try them on at home, return what didn't work. Um, another retail store has carved out a niche for themselves on social media that is highly recognizable. And a third one um, has had home shopping parties on Facebook Live set up in their store. So different businesses have changed so quickly, have adjusted, and as you've said, they, they've gone right through that wall. These people, they could change their name badge to just say entrepreneur, because really that's what they've done, is they've redefined what an entrepreneur is. Um, you know, and I know all three that you're, you're referring to here, and, and the first one you referred to, um, a woman I know that you know quite well, uh, 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 made face masks for her, for her business. And um, my own wife was thrilled to get a face mask in a delivery and then turned around and bought something else from that woman so that she could share another face mask with her sister <laughs> in Vancouver. So all of these are creative, uh, brilliant ideas, right? And um, uh, admirable. And, and uh, the, the social media one you're talking about, I mean, she turned around and dressed up mannequins and drove around town and and, and referred to the mannequins as the girls. Yeah. And she created a following that I would never have thought would be associated with her. I didn't see that in her personality. She was brilliant with it. Yeah. And um, so these people have taken unique approaches to, to get through it. And it's, you, you just have to, you know, smile with, with pride that the fact you know these people, right? Just some of the other good stuff that's happened is some of the businesses, I visited a couple last earlier this week, and uh, one of them, uh, and I don't know this particular business very well, but I, I popped in there and they were telling me they'd shut down for about a week because everybody else did. And then they realized they didn't have to shut down. They realized that people were peering in the window and kind of wanted to come in, so they'd let them in. And then they reopened. Um, their sales have been through the roof. Um, it, because they deal in a lot of stuff that people kind of want at home. Um, and uh, they've been just blown away by it. Another business been in, been around for about eight years. And um, uh, this particular owner was, was considering selling her business. She was disillusioned before all of this. Well, June, which just ended two days ago, uh, was her best month ever in, in eight years. Wow. So. Uh, and, Lear, and she kind of indicated to me she's taking the business off the market. It's given her renewed energy. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and she's been able to monitor and manage theft issues because of the ability to manage how many people are in the store. So it's kind of interesting, the twists and turns that this has provided is the, again, the, the business owners have found ways to um, manage a, tough road. Now, we are where we are, but I think we've all come to realize that we're not in control of this pandemic, that there could be another outbreak, there could be another wave coming in the fall. We don't have to look much further than south of the border to see how easily that can happen. And if that happens, if there is another wave, if there is a serious outbreak on Vancouver Island, can these businesses, these brilliant, talented, brave entrepreneurs, can they survive another total lockdown? Well, you know, three months ago, I would have said, no, they can't. I would have said, no, they can't survive the first wave of it. Uh, but now they're forcing me to second guess because they, they just have an ability and a desire and a personal commitment to get through this. And we're kind of fortunate in Port Alberni because it's not the first thing that's ever hit this town, right? <laughs> uh, it's maybe the most difficult 
but this community, this business community has seen it all and including now the pandemic. And um, so if any community is gonna pull through, you know, Port Alberni will. Um, it, you know, I do hope uh, that they embrace some of the options that are out there, like ourselves um, with support from the city. You know, we've developed the Better Buy Port Alberni website. Um, uh, it's, it's important that our business community uh, recognizes the, the the value of being online. Um, it's hugely important. Um, you, you just can't ignore it now. We're all online more right now. That's how we're meeting, right? Um, it's it's our new world, whether you like it or not. It's it's part of it. So I think that'll be an important part of any sort of uh, second wave if if we have one. Well, Bill, I hope you're right. I think in my heart that you're right. And I just have to say that you've been very good up until now. I know you've been itching to give a pitch to McLean Mill. We're talking about the return to um, the tourism economy, building up our economy to where it was again. And of course, McLean Mill is very dear to your heart. So I'm gonna give you a 60 seconds, Bill, to give me your best pitch why people in the Alberni Valley who are planning a staycation should visit McLean Mill. Well, you know me better than that, Nancy. I can't talk in 60 seconds, but uh, McLean Mill is a national historic site it's a pride and joy in our backyard and really all about uh, tourism this year is stay in your backyard. Um, and we have a lovely backyard, 30 plus acres out there. Uh, we now have a gift shop out there run by ourselves, uh, supporting local business. Um, we have food services about to start. We have camping opportunities there, RV, uh, rustic camping. Uh, people can go for walks, 32 acres, we're not gonna have any problem with social distancing, none whatsoever. It won't even be part of the discussion uh, because it's just a no brainer that we can that we can manage that. We've got a great team of people, um, and um, yeah, and we're and we're proud of that. As a, you know, ourselves here, we're proud of it, but also that we're proud that our community can offer that kind of environment um, for people to enjoy and and walk the site, run the site like the site, whatever they want to do, they can do it. Oh, Bill, you did really good. You kept it to 60 seconds. I had my doubts that you could do it, but you did it. And I've got to say that I just love your optimism about this community. And you know, I share your pride in, in the way our business people, our entrepreneurs have risen to the occasion, have met this challenge head on. So thank you so much for joining me here today, Bill. It's been an absolute pleasure to be here. Thanks very much. And thank you so much for joining us here on Upfront. I've been your host, Nancy Wilmot. We'll see you again soon.